it just gave us the freedom to just do what we want for the next you know three records and i think that's the best thing that could have happened to us and it means the next record you never know what's going to happen again and neither do we which i absolutely love as frontman Connor Mason explains, when it comes to Nothing But Thieves, there are no limits to where they can go musically or conceptually. Coming off the huge success of third studio album Moral Panic and its accompanying EP, they were free to explore new territory and challenge themselves to go beyond the typical confines of a rock band. The result is the sprawling, multifaceted concept album Dead Club City, a triumphant mix of catchy melodies and 1980s synths wrapped in a dark morality play exploring fame success and the need to feel seen. Connor joined us alongside his bandmates Joe and Dominic for our latest digital cover feature which you can read right now and you can watch some highlights right here from our discussion with Connor himself. I'm James Wilson Taylor and this is the Rock Sound album story of Dead Club City by Nothing But Thieves. So let's start with the kind of general sound of the record. So coming off Moral Panic and obviously the EP there as well, we talked about this a little bit before, but you know, it was it was very freeing for you guys. I feel like the the sky's the limit in terms of what genres you could kind of go with, in terms of what sounds you wanted to play with. I imagine coming then into a new album cycle, it must have felt that that free. You know, did it? I can see loads of different styles we'll get into here, but like as a starting point, did it feel like okay, let's just see what feels right? I think um, in kind of like true nothing but nothing but thieves fashion, we don't really ever overly think about what we're creating we just we are very kind of like present when we create and it's just in the moment for the song and it's just a kind of a sum of what you're into at the time where you're leaning into and it could be for a number of reasons it could be as simple as like being sick of um belting out songs every single song we ever do and when you're writing a set list and it's an well like joe's writing a set list and it's an hour and a half long and we're doing these songs that are just like ah, the whole time it's 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 <laughs> subconscious to be like let's kind of chill this out a little bit um and yeah like i said we whatever we're listening to at the time and that on this record is wildly different to what we were listening to before and but without really going we're going to make this sort of record we just do it on on the day when we're writing a song and it and it, it comes out naturally did it feel pressurized at all because i mean i i I feel like I feel like the answer is going to be kind of no with you guys because I feel like you do just settle in there, do what you want to do. As you've just said, you know, there's kind of no agenda in a way. It's just kind of what feels right. But it's fair to say that, that I mean, I mean, you went bigger than ever before, guys, on that last record. I mean, some of the biggest shows you ever played, the festival headline slots, and obviously such an amazing, amazing reception to not just the record but also the EP that followed it too. Um, does that weigh on your mind at all? Like, how do you follow something that big? Or are you able to just kind of put that to one side? I think we probably had that with Moral Panic. We probably had that slight thing of like, okay, we've become an established band. How do we get to that next level? And that kind of pressure probably made us um, try and expand a room and push the walls as far as we could. Um, and I don't know why we didn't do that this time. I, it's like we just stopped caring and we just wrote what we wanted to write. It felt felt quite like we were starting again like the first record of first EPs where we were just not putting pressure on ourselves and just trying to write and have like write the best songs and be creative and not really care about yeah the bigger we get the bigger the sound gets anything like that at all the diversity across the album it's already visible from those singles right I mean you you put out that you know the kind of title track welcome to the DCC and that's that's got big big 80s synth pop vibes and a little little touch of the weekends about it that it's it's very very cool and it's a good kind of opening bashing statement there but then overcome i almost want to say and i don't mean this derogatory at all almost soft rock in there there's a little yacht rock kind of playing in the background (laughs) of that at least in the intro do you know what i mean and like i feel like that sums up you guys all over and in the best positive way it's like there are no rules here and you set out your stall very very early tell me i guess a little bit about Picking singles would be something I'd ask you about because it is it is interesting to see what tracks you have picked to put out there ahead of the record and give people a taste because they are all so wildly different from each other too. Yeah, I think we had a bit of a fortunate accident with Welcome to the DCC because um, when we were writing it and, you know, because obviously Dom produces the record, we are doing a lot of the production before we even get into the studio to like properly record. We... Because, like Joe said, we didn't think that was going to be a single. We were just going to do like this little clip of it. 
we just had a lot of fun and we kind of almost took the mick in a sense and like made it pastiche and very over the top and very 80s and an invitation to this concept to this to this world um so we had no no restrictions on it so the the, the fortunate accident in that is the fact that we didn't put didn't have a single mindset on it as in like this this is going to be a single we need to keep it in that frame and then it turned out to be a single and we were like kind of bold enough well I think to to release that which it was a conversation we needed to have we were all like is this a bit much for a first single is are people gonna get people gonna freak out is this a bit weird but I'm glad we did that and I think I'm, I'm glad it was written that way around where we didn't think it was going to be a release you know I think we've um we we kind of fell on to nothing but thieves um, quite luckily when we f- did the first record where we just didn't know what we were doing and I think the the kind of mantra at the time was let's just try and fit this band this all, all rock band around Connor's like my voice and just see what that means and see like what what how can you do that because I've got quite like a I think quite like a poppy R and B voice naturally. Um, or like kind of classical voice and it was a real challenge for us to just figure out what that what that meant for a rock band and I think because that first record and the first EPs and stuff were all over the place and people seemed to like that that was the best thing we could possibly do and it gave us freedom forever basically it means that we never really had a fully fledged sound it just gave us the freedom to just do what we want for the next you know three records and I think that's the best thing that could have happened to us. And it means the next record, you never know what's going to happen again. And neither do we, which I absolutely love. And I think as well, like we, um, cause like the boys were saying, it's such a long time we've been writing this record. My, some of the starting points were during the pandemic and during the pandemic, it gave you that time to <clears throat> spend time listening to music again and falling back in love with music. And I think we were all going back to our roots of what we listened to growing up and and I, I definitely think personally for me I was just back listening to R&B and pop and soul and and then it just naturally comes out with what you want to write and what you want to create because you've just been absorbing it for like a year and a half during the pandemic um I feel like everything that I was adding to the table was just pop and R&B and I couldn't really help that because it was just what you're listening to and I think that, yeah, that, that's just like a, a, one other thing that um, made this record different. Like we had the time to kind of just fall back in love with music again, really. And when it comes time to actually adding vocals, Connor, tell me a little bit about playing characters, because that's that's got to be an interesting thing. It's a whole different approach for you in terms of vocal performance. Tell me a bit about yeah, figuring that it out. Is, isn't it? it is and it isn't. It's like... I mean, I've had this conversation with Dom and Joe millions of times, but I have to feel emotionally connected to whatever we're writing. So, like, we, even within the concept, it, everyone has to be emotionally connected to the album it, when we're producing, when we're making the music to fit around what we're trying to say. So for me, it's so, so important to get my head into what what we're saying, what we're outputting, and, and like... I'm a very emotional person anyway, so it's like when I sing, it's a really like important thing for me to do to to release what I'm feeling. So whenever I'm in the studio and whatever song we're doing, I'll be studying what I'm thinking and studying the song and connecting and putting out what I feel about it when I'm recording and connecting as heavily as I can to it. And But I would do that on every single song we do, regardless of the concept. Because like Joe said, I mean, like, the people don't know it yet but there are some real you know heightened emotions within this record it's just layered in a clever metaphor um which is great and really interesting for us to do but there's still so, i mean every single song we write there's a soul within the song that's that's a real key thing for us since the start it doesn't matter the way we dress it up it's like the song has to have soul and substance um and emotion otherwise it's just pointless you know it was really um it was really important for us to we'd seen some concept albums and the artwork the concept where you just know they're trying to be so futuristic and glitzy and glamorous and it's just it just falls on its feet as soon as you release it. 
Mm. Um, you're trying to timestamp it. And it was really important for us to not have a single timestamp or a location stamp as to any of this, not just the art, but like all the video, all of like the tangible stuff we've made, the merch, even like the way we like the styling, what we've been doing. Um, because yeah, like I said, it's, it, you didn't want people to be like, okay, it's an eighties record there in the eighties. And it's it, cause it's not like that at all. It's a mix. It's a mixed bag of, of sounds and drummers within the record. So for us, having the art to say that too was was really important and I think when Luke first understood that and was messing around with like the old Epcot retro futuristic thing where you just have no idea if that's in the 50s or in 2050 you know when they were originally designing that sort of stuff that was really that was a real um, godsend for us it was like yeah you've nailed that it's exactly where we want to head and we tried to carry we worked really hard and like carrying that feeling through all of the videos and stuff like that as well and like I said like even our own styling you don't know whether that's old school or if it's something super futuristic and so there was a lot of meticulous work from the from the get-go um about all of that. <laughs> <laughs>